welcome to our CNBC lunch discussion with Dr. Lauren Klein. And it's um, I'm the I'm Lynn Nygaard, the director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Klein, or if I may be so bold, Lauren. Um, um, she'll be talking about her research examining race and eating in the early United States. Um, Dr. Klein is an associate professor in the departments of English and quantitative theory and methods and directs the digital humanities lab here at Emory. Um, Dr. Klein works at the intersection of digital humanities, data science and early American literature with a research focus on issues of gender and race. Her interdisciplinary works appear and what I, I was um, thrilled to see this, truly interdisciplinary in both leading humanities journals as well as technical conferences. Yes, um, Dr. So Klein has two recent books, including Data Feminism, co-authored with Catherine D'Ignazio, um, published through MIT Press, and um, an archive of Taste, Race, and Eating in the Early United States, which she'll be talking about today, published at University of Minnesota Press. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Klein. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for really that such a kind and generous introduction. And thanks to everyone for making the time. Um, we were talking earlier about how we all know that it's November and our time is very precious. So appreciate your spending your virtual lunch time with me. Um, let me uh, share my screen here. Um, so I just wanted to start the formal par portion of my remarks with this land acknowledgement, um, as you know, which has recently been approved by Emory. And I thought that, you know, I spent so much time in the book that I will soon be talking about thinking about the cultural foundations of the United States, it seemed really necessary to me to acknowledge the physical foundation as well. Um, and even though we are virtual in this uh, particular event, we're all actually sitting on physical ground. And more information, as all of you likely know, um, can be found at this URL down here. So, as I mentioned, I'm going to be talking about this book, which at this point um, came, about, came out about a year ago. It was the culmination of many, many years of research that began as sort of traditional humanistic scholarship and brought me to and through some of the quantitative methods that have led me to my current position here with this joint appointment that I have between English and QTM. And so I picked a section of the book that to talk about that hopefully shows you some and illustrates some of that path, um, the ways in which qualitative methods help us see new things and then quantitative methods can take over for um, what we know is sort of in these large uh, textual archives and yet we don't have the human capacity to read all with our own uh, individual eyeballs. Um, but I wanted to back up and set the stage a little bit um, and just sort of offer the point of departure for my book, which is in some ways just pretty simple. It's that there is no eating in the archive. And I mean this sort of not only as the practical admonition that you often get when you were doing archival research, um, but also I mean it in a more methodological way, you know, when you are dealing with the textual record of the United States, there is literally no eating or at least no food preserved among the books and letters and newspapers and manuscripts, you know, all of these documents that as literary scholars and historians as well, um, you would turn to in order to consult uh, the print record. And before I get into the larger significance of this fact, I wanted to show just a quick concrete illustration of this point. Um, this is a letter written from Thomas Jefferson to James Madison in 1787. It was when Jefferson was serving as minister to France. Um, and it's fairly generic. That's actually one of the reasons why I've chosen it. Um, it's pretty much uh, Jefferson just asking for things. And you can see maybe depending on how large your screen is um, where I've highlighted Jefferson is requesting that Madison send him, quote, a few barrels of Newtown Pippins, these are a variety of apple, um, and then some cranberries to eat, 
along with some roots of the apple tree for him to attempt to plant in France. He says these roots would be, quote, very desirable to him. And then he proceeds to give these very detailed packing instructions for how they should be layered between sheets of moss, um, which is also sort of classic Jefferson, this kind of obsessive management and control. And I'll have sort of more uh, conceptually and argumentatively to say on that as well. Um, but the point that I want to make here by starting with this letter is just obvious. It's that, you know, we don't have these apples or cranberries anymore to look at, let alone eat, even though on the basis of these, this letter, we know that they were quite important to Jefferson at the time. So the basic question then becomes like, what is a scholar interested in the idea of food and eating in this era, the era of the early Republic supposed to do? And as I mentioned before, I've spent a lot of years thinking about this, um, you know, thinking about all these constraints. So how do you explore food that you can't taste about an understanding of eating that is really far removed from what we take to be our sort of present food culture? Um, and then what are some methods that we can use to try to recover some of this lost information, or if not fully recover, then to try to reimagine these experiences of eating that are embedded in this archive, but that aren't directly or fully documented. And in the process of doing this sort of reconstructive work, I've also been drawn to the more conceptual paths by which eating came to matter in that particular temporal moment. And I think this is where there are a lot of overlaps with the work of CNBC more broadly. I'm um, thinking not just about the sort of physical experience, but also what does it mean when you're ingesting these foods in your body, when your brain takes over, and how do you balance between sort of physical sensation and cognitive response? And so, I make a historical argument in the book that if you're interested in, we can talk a little bit more about later. And it's essentially that this proposition that you see here that over the course of the 18th century, eating emerged as this new form of aesthetic expression. And it subsequently transformed into a politicized one, um, a means of expressing both allegiance to and resistance to this sort of uh, dominant enlightenment worldview. And so that's sort of the, the historical and theoretical claim. But there's a second part of this claim, which is that we can't really fully appreciate the depth of this aesthetic mode, um, let alone the actual people who contributed to its development by relying on only the textual artifacts, like the ones you just saw, um, the sort of the hard evidence of the food that the founders like to eat. Um, we also necessarily, both for historical and ethical reasons, need to account for these experiences of eating that resist preservation, as well as the experiences of the people who were involved in, for example, like crating up the apples that Jefferson wanted, or for a related example, the particular person who prepared each of the meals that Thomas Jefferson ate. And we actually do know this person's name. His name was James Hemings. Um, he was Sally Hemings' older brother. And that family connection already gives his life a fair amount of historical context. But what we know about the specifics of James Hemings' life comes to us through a set of documents that are very different from the letter, the letter about apples and cranberries that I began with. Um, you know, his life is documented in artifacts like this one. So what you're seeing here is an emancipation agreement between Jefferson and Hemings. Um, it was written by Jefferson and it was witnessed and signed not by Hemings, uh, but by his maitre d'hôtel, uh, a Frenchman who was white, um, essentially the like a house manager type figure. And some of the backstory is this. So Jefferson loved food so much and believed that it was so important to advancing the cause of the Republic that when he went to France um, to assume this appointment as minister there, he also required that James Hemings come with him. And as soon as he got there, Jefferson had Hemings apprentice to the chef of a former prince. Um, and so Hemings learned to cook in the high French style. And in the process, he learned to speak and write in fluent French as well as English. Um, and also because in France, uh, slavery had already been abolished at that point, Hemings learned what it was like to be free. And uh, 
Annette Gordon-Reed, a phenomenal scholar and legal, actually a law professor and also historian, um, has a book called The Hemingses of Monticello and has a really excellent consideration of what this experience in France might have been like for Hemings um, to go from being enslaved in the United States to be, being treated as if you were a free man in France. So if you're interested in that, you can, you can look more there. But for the moment, I just want to focus on this document and the specific language by which it outlines the conditions for Hemings and Mansell, uh, eventual emancipation. And just as an, sort of another aside, um, this is another thing that we can talk about a little later. I really maintain a focus on language throughout the book in part due to the fact that I'm trained as a literary scholar and not as a historian. And even though in this early time period, scholars of early American literature analyze things that look a lot like historical documents, we analyze them in different ways than historians do. In any case, um, we can see here how Jefferson acknowledges Hemings' invaluable contributions to his dinner table, his quote, art of cookery. Um, and at the same time, he begrudges Hemings, this is the man whom Jefferson himself enslaved, um, he begrudges Hemings the quote, great expense of training him up as a chef. And he expresses this desire to befriend him. So there's this uh, sort of interesting and upsetting projection of what Sidia Hartman has called this sort of circumscribed humanity that's often accorded uh, by enslavers to the enslaved. And then Jefferson also goes on to stipulate that if Hemings can train another man, uh, Jefferson will set him free. So in effect, he's forcing Hemings to trade his culinary knowledge for his corporeal freedom. Um, and in a way, like right here in this document, is the argument that I make in the 200 some odd pages of the book. Um, but I do want to elaborate a bit more. Um, so what you see here is very clear and very specific evidence of the contradictions of Jefferson's sort of lowercase r republicanism. So his insistence on these ideals of liberty and equality at the same time that he relied upon people he enslaved like James Hemings in order to put these ideals on public display. And this contradiction is not new. Many, many scholars have explored it over the years. Um, but what I want to show with this specific example is that if you focus on Hemings and people, the other people sort of around Jefferson, who uh, you can quote Lynn Manuel, Manuel Miranda, um, we're going to come back to Hamilton a little bit later as well, um, sort of the people who were in the room where it happened, how a focus on these people opens up the story that we can tell about the nation's cultural foundation. Um, and because of how culture functioned at that particular moment, its political foundation as well. Um, and what we gain is this additional set of actors and actions, but also we gain a new set of theories about taste um, to sort of get back to this argument about aesthetics that I was glossing a few minutes ago. Um, and all of these, the actors and the actions and the theories all together really enrich our understanding in the present about by whom and by what means this sort of national cultural foundation was composed. So, what I wanna do just for the rest of my, my formal time today is talk a little bit more concretely about James Hemings contributions to this cultural foundation, along with some of, like I said before, some of the methods that I employed in writing the book that helped me expand the significance of the gaps in our knowledge about Hemings life, um, as well as some of the other enslaved chefs and valets and other culinary figures who contributed to this larger project. And then at the end, if I have time, I'll sort of see how I'm going. I might quickly discuss a few other examples from the book that il illustrate some additional methods we might use in order to sort of infuse this archive with new meaning. So uh, I'll just keep an eye on the time here. So I wanna just pick up uh, James Hemings' life here in February, 1801. So this is eight years after Jefferson penned that emancipation agreement that you saw on the previous slide, but only five years after Jefferson legally granted Hemings his freedom. And what you can see here is a letter written from Jefferson to a man named William Evans, who ran an inn up in Baltimore. Um, and I just, I'm switching over to the digital edition of these documents for reasons that will become clear pretty soon. Um, 
In any case, Jeffers said he wasn't particularly close to this man, but his inn served as a relay point for the mail route up and down the East Coast. So Evans just had contact with a lot of people. So pretty much anyone in his area who wanted to send something by mail or who wanted to check if they had received a letter in the mail, they came to this inn. And you can see here that Jefferson references a conversation that he had had with Evans in the past. He writes, quote, you mentioned to me in conversation here that you sometimes saw my former servant, James, and he made his engagement so as to keep himself always free to come to me. Could I get the favor uh, of you to send for him and tell him I shall be glad to receive him as soon as he can come to me? I um, mean, Jefferson at this point was only two weeks away from assuming the presidency. So his inauguration would take place on March 4th of that year. Um, and it, now you would sort of describe where he was if you watch a lot of Top Chef as like saying he was kind of in the weeds, right? Um, and he actually admits as much when he apologizes to Evans. Um, he says, quote, the truth is that I'm so much embarrassed in composing a good household for myself as in providing a good administration for our country. And so embarrassed here just means in the archaic sense, like experiencing difficulties. And so here you see in Jefferson's language, an indicator of the equivalence, this really direct equivalence that Jefferson identified between his household and his governing. So between the quality of the food that he served at his table, and then the quality of the government that he intended to oversee. And so I should actually just um, back up a little bit here. So I've sort of taken for granted thus far that you know that Jefferson was really into food. Um, he's often been called the nation's founding foodie. And in some ways he really was. So just to give a few examples of this, this is Jefferson's diagram of a macaroni machine, um, a pasta machine, which he first encountered in Italy and brought back home with him to Monticello. Um, Here's a recipe for ice cream. This is written out in Jefferson's own hand. He actually played a large part in popularizing ice cream in the United States. Um, although actually uh, George Washington actually was the first one who, there's a long history of ice cream. That's kind of a digression. Um, it wasn't just the particular foods that Jefferson ate or that he forced Hemings to prepare though. It was what he thought they meant. Um, and so for Jefferson, food was really emblematic of these broader Republican ideals. So when he was in Paris, he deliberately and somewhat ostentatiously cultivated a variety of indigenous American ingredients in his garden there. Um, and he would sort of performatively serve them to his guests. He developed a new serving style in which plates were placed directly on the table and then the guests could serve themselves. This was in contrast to having meals uh, being served by other people. And again, he intended this to represent uh, sort of this virtue and simplicity of this new country. Um, he introduced the idea of using a round or sometimes oval table rather than a rectangular one, and also didn't have assigned seats. And I think as teachers, we all know the significance of shapes of tables and where people sit. Um, and all of these were gestures that were intended to express sort of this egalitarianism inherent in the nation's founding, and then also to foster a respectful exchange of ideas across the table. Um, the idea would, would be that these practices would sustain the nation's future growth. So all of these sort of theories and practices of eating came together in the meal known as the dinner table bargain, which is dramatized in Hamilton with the song that I mentioned before, The Room Where It Happens. Um, and it's a little bit of a cliche at this point to talk about Hamilton in an early American context, um, but I, I couldn't really resist. Um, so you, you may or may not know the dinner table bargain. It was one of the most famous acts of political compromise in the early Republic, um, at least as Jefferson tells the story, although actually that's been dis disputed. Um, as he explains it, he invited Hamilton and John Adams to what he described as, quote, a little dinner at his house. And he was hoping to resolve the issue of states' debts without a political fight. Um, the Result about the debt is less interesting, but one of the bargaining chips in the negotiation was the permanent location of the capital. So probably the most enduring consequence of this dinner was that the capital relocated from New York, where it was located temporarily, to what would become Washington, D.C. Um, and Lin-Manuel Miranda, he incorporates all of this into the lyrics in Hamilton. So in the song, you hear David Diggs as Jefferson singing, quote, I arranged the meeting, I arranged the menu, the venue, the seating. 
But as we've learned in the past couple of minutes, it was actually James Hemings who arranged the menu and then cooked the food um, that Jefferson, John Adams, and Hamilton ate that night. But if we take this as a prompt to say, you know, okay, let's investigate this person, let's find out exactly what he did and let's celebrate it. Um, if we take that as our charge and go looking for more information about Hemings' life in the archive, what we find is actually quite scant. Um, and this scantness has to do with Hemings' status as a black man in the cultural context of the early United States. So going back to that letter that I was discussing a few minutes ago, you might remember that Jefferson only refers to Hemings in the letter as, quote, my former servant James. Um, that's the part that you can see here highlighted in green. And actually, it's only because a scholar in the 20th century who has annotated this particular letter for the published version of the Jefferson papers, they know that the James there referred to James Hemings. Um, you can see this connects to this editorial note at the bottom. Um, this is the only reason that we can associate this reference to James, which was and remains a very common name, um, with James Hemings at all. But if you go and do like an author search for James Hemings in the same archive, which at this point contains almost 50,000 documents, either written by or to Jefferson, um, and that's not even including all the other founders who are included in this broader collection, you still get no results. And this is because Hemings, you know, this is a man whom Jefferson had only until quite recently enslaved, he was not a person to whom he would deign to ever write directly. Um, and you can actually see this in this request that he makes to Evans to quote, send for him and tell him, I shall be glad to receive him. And so Jefferson made this request indirectly, even though as we've already learned, Hemings could read and write not only in English, but also in French. Um, there's no reason why Jefferson couldn't have just sent him a letter instead, right? Um, and so this is not just a failure of our limits of search, sort of our ability to type the right keywords into the browser, but it's also a really striking indictment of the power relations that overdetermine the contents are of our archives, um, or what's often described in shorthand as archival silence. Um, there are a lot of articulations of this phenomenon, but the most powerful to me remains uh, this one by Michel Rolf Truyot in Silencing the Past. Um, he writes, and I'm just going to read it. He says, silences enter the process of historical production at four crucial moments. The moment of fact creation or the making of sources, the moment of fact assembly or the making of archives, the moment of fact retrieval or the making of narratives, and the moment of retrospective significance or the making of history in the final instance. So Truyo's formulation allows us to see really clearly how silences enter the archive, but more powerfully, it allows us to see how we might move beyond those silences. In other words, how we might recognize the silence introduced into the historical record as a result of prior decisions about the making of sources and archives and narratives and history, and then begin the work of writing or sort of filling in those silences. And a lot of the work I was trying to do in this book was contribute as I could sort of in my own way as a single scholar to this much larger task. You know, with that said, I think there's an important caveat here, which has to do specifically with the archive of slavery and how that archive, as Sidia Hartman describes as quote, predicated upon impossibility. You know, Hartman is also, you know, a very well-known scholar, so you may already be familiar with these words. This is from Venus in Two Acts. That's the essay in which Hartman works through the difficulty of her own desire to counter the silence of the archive without at the same time committing further violence and with any new act of narration. And Hartman, as you may or may not know, she's since turned to her own method of what she calls critical fabulation which she sort of prefigures in this essay. Um, and it involves essentially telling uh, creative nonfiction, but bolstered by archival and historical research. Um, and I was really inspired by this kind of thinking, this idea of actively working to make the existing archive mean as much as it possibly can, and doing so by all of the methods that I knew how to use in order to do so. And so just um, as sort of the, the last, component of this 
talk, I wanted to show briefly how I use some methods that fall under the rubric of digital humanities to perform this work with respect to James Hemings. And I just want to emphasize here that my goal was not to redress his absence from the archive, but rather to attest in new ways to his life and his community and his kin. So what you're looking at here is something called a correspondence network. It's a diagram of people like William Evans to whom Jefferson wrote or from whom Jefferson received letters. Um, in this particular instance, I've limited this just to the letters that were about James Hemings and I compiled this network data by searching the archives and the notes for instances of James Hemings and then converting it um, into sort of this standard uh, data format that is required for a network analysis. Um, essentially, you know, the, the nodes, the two people on either end of a letter, the sender and the receiver, and then if they sent one letter, that becomes a count of one, if they sent two, a count of two, and so on. So pretty basic uh, arithmetic here. Um, so obviously, you know, this is the Jefferson Archive, so he's at the center of all of these letters, and you can see some of these arcs that make sense, right? He's talking to his neighbors, he's talking to his agent who's buying things and selling him uh, things for him, um, a couple of other people that you can sort of easily uh, craft a historical explanation for. Um, and presumably Jefferson was corresponding with each of these people about these materials and services that were required for Hemings to create his food. And so even this simple network view, and I'll complicate it in a minute, but even from this simple view, I think it makes visible what I like to think about as the reach of Hemings cooking. So it's centered in the kitchen, but it's really extending across Monticello and into the region in terms of the ingredients he purchased, the dinners he prepared, and in turn, the politics he influenced through the flavors of his food. Um, but the one that stands out here, and it's actually um, one of the ones that's a little bit of an outlier, is this one to William Evans. Um, so I noted before uh, Evans, because of his location at this, this inn that he ran, he was this node in what was really a material print network, right? And because of this reason, Evans' presence in the Jefferson archive really pops out. He was someone to whom many people were contacting because he had the ability to distribute or circulate information. And in contrast to searching for James Hemings in the archive, if you actually search for William Evans, you get a chain of correspondence that includes the discussion about James Hemings through which you can actually discern what happens to him. Um, Evidently, Hemings had already been involved in negotiations for employment with Jefferson well before Jefferson sought Evans's, Evans's help. Um, and likely what was going on was that, you know, having been enslaved for the first 25 years of his life, Hemings likely understood the importance of defining the terms of his employment in advance. So you can see here that he's requesting through another acquaintance that Jefferson, quote, send him a few lines of engagement and on what conditions and what wages Jefferson would please to give him. And then he further specifies that the offer should be in, quote, Jefferson's own handwriting. So this is Hemings demonstrating his own awareness of the power of print, um, and in particular, the power of Jefferson's personal hand. He's the president-elect, right, to stand uh, to sort of stand in for the de jure agreement that his status as a black man, even a free black man at that point, really precluded from ever wielding to its full effect. Um, and for reasons that people don't know Jefferson, he failed to comply with this request. Um, and so the next letter that you see is from Evans back to Jefferson, and it documents Hemings' confident tone. We don't know exactly what Hemings said, but Evans reports to Jefferson, quote, um, the answer he returned to me was that he would not go to Washington until you should write to him yourself. Um, so in this letter, we get this really powerful confirmation of Hemings' literacy, his business acumen, his determination. Um, but despite its importance, this letter doesn't appear in the results of a search for James Hemings because the editors have not marked it as referring to James Hemings um, as they did in the previous letter. So there's no way to find it unless you're sort of reading sequentially. Um, whether or not Evans influenced the outcome of the situation, we just don't know. Um, we do know that Hemings never became a chef at the White House. There's an eight month gap in the correspondence between Jefferson and Evans. 
And then in the next, and it's actually, it's the last exchange, it's from November of that year, it confirms what Evans describes as, quote, the melancholy circumstance of Hemings' suicide. So just to return to the, the Hartman quote that I had up on the screen a few minutes ago, the story of James Hemings is yet another version of the story she's describing here. It's quote, predicated upon impossibility, right? To tell the story involves listening to the unsaid, translating misconstrued words, refashioning these lives that have been disfigured by slavery, um, and in, intent on achieving this impossible goal, which is this idea that it is possible to redress the violence that produced these numbers and ciphers and fragments that constitute slavery's archive. And, you know, I'd like to think in the case of James Hemings, even as we consider all of the information that is disclosed to us through Jefferson's correspondence, we're reminded with the foreknowledge of his suicide, how little of the life of James Hemings will ever truly know. Um, we do not, and arguably we should not, have access to that information. So is it possible to visualize this impossibility? This was the question that I found myself facing. Um, and then as the secondary question, is this a task that should be undertaken at all? And Hartman in this particular essay, she laments that she hasn't yet discovered a way of what she describes as quote, de-arranging the archive so that it can recall the contents of a person's life or some sort of truer or clearer picture. Um, and, you know, in the, the historiography, she would go on, she is going on um, to pursue this task. And over the past decade, she's really been working through her own method of doing that, culminating in this book, which came out a couple of years ago, um, just as I was finishing my own project. And um, some of the figures, interestingly, who Hartman focuses on are the women who encountered, this is sort of a, a side note, um, but the women who encountered W.E.B. Du Bois as he conducted the data collection for the report that would become the famed Philadelphia Negro Report. Um, and this is one which has become really a foundational in the history of data visualization and what it can do when visu data visualization is enlisted towards uh, social ends. And so I've been thinking a lot about the additional connections between how Hartman provides the stories behind the data visualizations in that report and how I use data visualization in my own book um, as a way of opening up the space for these sort of creative stories like these. So uh, the second network diagram that I created for this book, um, I decided rather than representing the people writing and receiving letters, I wanted to show the people who were mentioned in the same set of letters. So people like the quote, former servant James that I began this talk by uh, mentioning. Um, and if you're interested, I can talk a little bit more about how I created the diagram later, but the conceptual point of this image is to emphasize the complexity of relationships. Um, both among people and across social groups. And probably most significantly, um, the arcs that connect Jefferson to the men and women he enslaved are much more prominent than, than those that link him even to his family members and friends. And in this image, it suggests the heightened degree to which Jefferson relied on his enslaved plantation staff to enact his various directives. So you could think back to that request that I began my talk by talking about, about sending him apples while he was in France, packed by this layer of moss, um, or the provisions for his table, or the seeds for his garden. Um, you know, all of these other supplies that supported his more political and theoretical project of producing this um, sense of Republican taste. And in a way, this visualization conjures a sense of the scope of Jefferson's dependence on these men and women in order to advance this project. And this remains true even as we can't recreate what these people said um, in their conversations, either with Jefferson or with each other, um, where, even where they went to conduct their transactions or anything about how they truly lived their everyday lives. But what I hope this image does is rather than represent the archive that's something that's static or fits, it sort of resists what um, scholars like Stephen Best have talked about as the quote, logic and ethic of recovery. Um, this logic that, you know, in spite of our best aspirations to recover these lost voices and these lost people, instead you're sort of reinscribing these people and these voices as sort of irreparably lost. 
And so what I'm hoping to do with images like these is challenge us as scholars to make these unrecorded stories that we encounter, whether they're about eating or about other aspects of life, really expand um, with motion and with meaning. So I actually think I'm doing, I'm doing okay for time. I just wanna briefly discuss a few other of these unrecorded stories that I consider in the book. Um, and then the methods that I use, which are emphatically not digital um, to try to sort of reanimate them. So the first is that of Melinda Russell, who is um, currently believed to be the first black woman to author a cookbook in the United States. Um, so her ar archival trace is almost like the mirror image of James Hemming. So unlike his story, which is stitched together through mentions in the correspondence and others, um, the only thing we know about Melinda Russell's life is the story that she tells herself. Um, it's this two page autobiography um, that she uh, appends to the beginning of her cookbook. So we learned that in the 1850s, um, she set off from Eastern Tennessee where she was born to seek a new life in Liberia. Um, but she ended up getting robbed along the way by a member of the party that was traveling with her. And she had to find a job immediately um, because her money had been stolen and the work she found was to work as a cook. Um, and after time, uh, she moved around a little bit in the South and she opened a highly regarded pastry shop. And actually it's her pastry recipes that you can see here that uh, became the core of this cookbook. And she self-published it in 1866. But the question that remains for the scholar, um, at least for me, which is how you make this cookbook, like how do you make it mean something more? And so what I do in that chapter of the book is to think really long and hard about what a cookbook is intended to do, um, who it's intended to be used by, and then who it's intended to benefit. Um, and then I end up with what I think is my favorite theoretical argument of the book, which is about how Russell intended her recipes to elicit satisfaction. And in the chapter, I build out an argument about Russell's theory of satisfaction as a counterpoint to this dominant discourse of aesthetic taste. Um, and this dominant discourse is obviously, it's the one that structured uh, Jefferson and Hemings relationship and that encapsulated so much about the dominant Republican ideology of the time. Um, but like, can we think outside of this discourse? Can we find a counter discourse or sort of one outside of this narrow enlightenment conception of the human subject? Um, that's what this chapter tries to do. Um, and then another one of the, the artifacts that I consider um, is this portrait. Um, you can see the original on the left and a UV analysis on the right. It's also the image that's on the cover of the book. Um, this was a portrait that for many years was attributed to Gilbert Stewart, the artist that painted the portrait of George Washington that appears on the $1 bill. Um, people thought uh, for a very long time that this was a portrait painted of a man named Hercules, who was George Washington's enslaved cook, um, at least until 2017. Um, I had a friend go visit. It was installed in sort of a gilded frame in a museum in Madrid with the title Portrait of George Washington's Cook. Um, but just as I was preparing to submit the final manuscript of this book, I discovered that the painting had been deauthenticated, and it actually turned out that the portrait was not of Hercules. It was not even of a chef and it wasn't painted by Gilbert Stewart. Um, the UV analysis did confirm that the painting dated to that era. That's what you can see in the image on the right. Um, but the giveaway was the chef's hat. These were not introduced until the 1820s. Um, and so the painting could not have been of a chef if it was painted in the 1790s. Um, and to the extent that art historians have placed it and they're still working on this, they believe that it was likely a portrait of a Creole man, probably um, in Dominica, wearing what was then just a very fashionable uh, head wrap. Um, there's actually, there's a lot more that can be done with this misattribution, but the point that I make in the book is that it's more about the desire on the one hand and then the disappointment that follows on the other when this turned out not to be a portrait of Hercules um, and how this desire and disappointment together confirm just how much we long for some sort of satisfying archival evidence that quite simply, not only do we not have now, but likely did not ever exist in the first place. So uh, just to wrap up, I'll say, you know, while we may never be able to perceive someone like Hercules's face, um, and we certainly will not be able to meet the gaze of people like James Hemings or Melinda Russell, my hope is that by placing their range of forms of food and cookery, which are also 
um, forms of aesthetic expression um, by placing them all alongside each other, whether they're the archival fragments that attest to Hemings cookery or to the self-published cookbook that attests to Russell's culinary philosophy, we can really ar expand our sense in the present of the richness of these aesthetic experiences that took place in the past. So these and all of the cultural artifacts that I discuss in the book, they each carry with them their own theory of taste, um, how lived experience enters into cultural production, and then how that experience both shapes and is shaped by political constraints. Um, and so for the enslaved figures in this study in particular, this expanded conception of taste as including eating um, and not just aesthetic discernment opens up additional space for their contributions to aesthetic philosophy to be recognized as such. Um, and at the same time, I don't want this opening to be viewed again as any form of redress. Um, what I understand it for is as a call to action um, for us both as scholars, but also just as readers um, to sort of push up and to continue to push up against the bounds of our knowledge and to really push ourselves to develop new techniques to find meaning or additional meaning from these fragments of the past. Um, and so that's uh, it for me. You can send email to me here. And um, if you are interested in a hard copy of the book, uh, you can also email me. I can just give you a copy. But if you felt like purchasing it, there's a promo code if you order it directly from University of Minnesota Press. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was um, such an interesting presentation. And what I'd like to do if, if you're amenable is to, if any of our attendees would like to ask some questions now, maybe generate some discussion. Um, and if you're interested, just, um, well, if you're interested in asking a question, right, um, just um, unmute um, or throw something into the, oh, put the promo code in the chat. We could do that. Oh yeah, sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, you know, one question I had, and, and this is coming from, um, you know, um, really, a naive question, I think, um, is this, um, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to um, um, reconcile these, these different aesthetics and how we can think about what James Hemings was required to do, right, to the extent that we can imagine it or animate it in a way, um, versus, um, the woman who wrote the cookbook, right? So, what sorts of what sorts of requirements? And I obviously I haven't read the book, right? Um, but what sorts of requirements, you know, constrained their aesthetics? And where were there areas that we could think of them being able to express their own sense of taste? Or if you get any sense of that from the archive or from your sort of consideration of the archive? Did that question? Make that's really one that I struggled with throughout the, yeah, I mean, I think so. I think I have, I have some thoughts. I don't know if thoughts that will be helpful in continuing this conversation. But in this book by, because I really liked food, you know, to the topic. I was interested. I personally like eating and I like eating tea. And then I, you know, in a particular time period led me to aesthetics. Um, and the ways in which aesthetics in the 18th century was understood even before it was articulated as formal philosophical. I mean, one of the really interesting things about aesthetics is that it worked backwards from the way that you expect theory to be to evolve and that one would think that it's philosophers developing sophisticated um, term-laden 
the, you know, capital T theory that then sort of filters down to the mainstream and becomes more popularized. But in terms of aesthetic discourse, it actually happened the other way around, where even the word aesthetic sort of didn't enter philosophical discourse until the very tail end of the 18th century. And even then it was in German, it took a while to be translated into English. And so even philosophers um, like Hume and Keynes, and even before that, the sort of the early uh, sort of taste philosophers, they only had this metaphor of eating. And so you get this, so there's a very clear connection between people think both sort of people theorizing about the significance of eating, and then also people actually eating and thinking about what it means in terms of taste. Um, and so there's this very clear connection. So it's like, well, you know, I like to think that James Hemings and Melinda Russell understood their cooking as participating in this larger project of producing the sort of national aesthetic sense. Um, and in a way that is affirming, right? You know, we all like a story that says we used to like, we used to only credit these, you know, famous white men, the founding fathers. Now we can expand how that taste was produced when we invite in a wider range of actors. And that's sort of like a heartening, uh, you know, a heartening and a story that, um, you know, we can feel good about. And yet it doesn't solve the problem that the purpose of cultivating taste, both in the United States in particular, and sort of of these 18th century taste philosophers and even later aesthetic philosophers like Kant, you know, um, later, it was, a, it was a homogenizing one, right? I mean, the project of, of cultivating taste is to go from your instinctual response to um, whatever, you know, whether it's food or music or art, to something that is somehow has a layer of, um, a layer of reason or um, at least judgment imposed on top of it, right? And that normalizing function means that necessarily it is um, the taste that is produced, if it is coming from within, in this case, like a US political project, is the one that is necessarily exclusionary, targeted towards producing people who behave like the sort of enlighten the ideal enlightenment human subject who is a white property owning man, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's like, can you even, is that our goal to be like, oh, look, everyone is contributing to this normalizing homogenizing project, right? right and right. so then the question became, and I actually, I, in truth, I feel like in writing the book, and this began as a dissertation embarrassingly long, a long time ago, <laughs> had I started the project now, I probably would start, have started outside of that framework, but since I started within it, over the course of the book, I had to sort of work my way out. And so then you need to start to ask, like, are there ways that you can look for parallel projects involving food and thinking about the cultural or theoretical work of eating or preparing or serving food that stand outside of this sort of uh, the sort of dominant project. And I do think, and I, I don't think we know enough about James Hemings in order to be able to say that he either does or does not do any of that other stuff, right? But with Russell, one of the really interesting things that you get from her introduction, and you can actually, um, there's an interesting, you can, the, the sort of discovery of the cookbook was covered in the New York Times a couple of years ago. You can Google it and you can find a version of the cookbook that's been scanned. And if you're curious, you can read her autobiography, which is really only a page and a half. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that happens is she, even in that page and a half, she is constantly thwarted by her attempts to participate in formal democracy, right? Like she's on her way in essential in a, to uh, begin a new life in this new democratic country of Liberia, right? right. And instead she's attacked, um, she's physically attacked and she loses her money so she can't go. Later, um, she is, uh, experiences another, uh, another violent uh, incident um, likely, well, certainly because she's living in Tennessee and she's attacked by uh, pro-Confederacy people. They're not named as the KKK or anything like that, but like they're clearly, uh, it's like a white racist mob who, um, again, sort of, and she says, I was attacked because of my political principles, right? So again, she's trying to live in this country, participate in the way that uh, at least, you know, in 18, in the 18, at this point was like 1850s probably, was understood as you know being a worthy, valuable citizen, which means she was a small business owner. She was 
producing things, she was earning money, she was supporting her son, um, and all of this gets taken away from her um, because of racism, essentially. Um, and then she turns outside of it and she says like, look, I don't, I'm gonna walk away. She moves, she um, goes and settles in Michigan, which at that point was pretty you know, far on the frontier. And she says, look, I'm just gonna earn some money. That's what I wanna do. Like, forget about politics. I'm gonna earn myself some money so that I can make a life for myself. I can support my kid. And eventually I wanna go back there and reclaim my things. And so you see this really interesting sort of proto-capitalist impulse that is separate from the sort of belief in formalized democratic and governing structures. And so this is, I'm sort of, I'm like rambling here, but I actually think no, this no, is no. a good question. So yeah. to me, it's like, that's sort of where you see some interesting alternative formulations that are coming from outside of the system that I think actually could be further developed into some interesting sort of complementary theories that I wouldn't even call aesthetics or taste or whatever, it's something else. Right. Um, in the book, I sort of theorize it in terms of satisfaction. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that there's a lot, like there's sort of, there's definitely more work that could be done along those lines um, by attending to these little details about the people who were not embraced by the dominant structure, but who instead were excluded sometimes forcibly and violently from it. Right. Right, really, really interesting. Um, that's a, she's, it's so interesting that she was, she was involved in this back to, you know, to, she wanted to travel to Liberia, right? And, and participate in that project, you know? And then it, of course, sounds like it didn't, you know, she was, you know, a, a, a target of violence in that context as well. But that's an interesting, you know, that she's, she's searching for these ways to be a citizen, as you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Depending on what, what context. Um, any, any other questions, Dan? Um, yeah, I had a quick, uh, here. Graham. There you go. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> Hi, Dan. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hi. It's good to see you all. I am um, actually have a class at one, so I'm sorry that I have to go so soon. I was just kind of curious about um, nu like nutrition, whether does nutrition enter into these discourses or discussions? Um, did you encounter any ways in which like discourses about nutrition sort of interface or come up against like questions of aesthetics or questions of, of um, you know, questions of class as well? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there's someone else who's not me who's written a lot about this named Keila Tompkins, who has a book called Racial Indigestion. And among other things, she has a chapter on Sylvester Graham, who invented the graham cracker in the 1820s and 30s. Um, and that's coming out of actually a really long uh, and sort of waxing and waning temperance movement. And so I think the sort of the long, like the, I didn't necessarily talk about this in the book, but there is sort of an undercurrent, well, there's an, there's an underlying tension that, again, waxes and wanes over time between sort of this myth of Puritan simplicity and temperance, and which really was sort of a, by the time you get to the 1790s, like a cultural rather than a religious undercurrent, but this belief that the simple life was the best life. Um, and the reality, and again, this is you know, proven by scholars over the past 20, 30 years, that if you led a simple life, you've actually saved a lot of money in the United States um, in the late colonial era. And so then you could actually buy a lot of stuff. So how do you reconcile the fact that simple living leads to a a personal or a family economic surplus, which you then can use in order to buy things. And it leads among them like food and uh, fancy tablewares and things like this. And so it leads to this really interesting tension. And some people, I would say almost everyone who I study like Jefferson and Franklin and Madison and Adams, they all, when it's convenient for them, they fall back upon claims of temperance and simplicity. Although the reality is when living their lives, they totally indulge in whatever they could find that was available to them. Um, and yeah, that's a, that's, it's a really interesting question. Um, but uh, but as, again, it's interesting, like there was, food was in most places for most people uh, available and to the large degree in abundance with the exception of people who were enslaved in certain regions of the South, and that also varied um, regionally. So, um, 
so yeah so yeah so i guess that's uh, that's that's an answer to that question sort of <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> yeah. um i wish i could stay for longer but i do have to go um but um it's really really fascinating um and i'm looking forward to reading the book so thank you thank you well um if there um are no other questions i think we'll let lauren um get on with um get on with her day thank you so much this was so interesting and hopefully we can do it again when we can all actually eat together <laughs> um in the center um so thank you so much and we really appreciate it thanks so much i'm so glad to be here thanks for having me again